can't really see it behind the sign, but this is the study. They're doing some serious renovations here. The study, for those of you who don't know, is a very fancy private school in Westmount, Quebec. Dawning because it's Pride Month, the 2S LGBTQIA plus flag front and center. The study is an all girls school, just so everybody appreciates the absolute madness of this. The study, flying the 2S LGBTQIA plus flag, front and center. Apparently they have gender neutral bathrooms inside. That's a rumor that I have heard that I have not been able to substantiate. It's an all girls school. Let that sink in. Uh, we can we can end this. I'm going to leave that up Can't in the really backdrop. Uh, this is a, let me just bring this out, an apropos beginning uh, to what's going to be a very, very interesting stream. If, if nobody knows who Natalie Jean Beisner is, and I think it's Beisner, not Beisner, Beisner. Um, if you don't know who she is, you will after the stream. Because it's it's interesting, like the internet is a glorious place where you get exposed to things that frustrate you, but then you also get exposed to refreshing uh, new voices. And you say, I'd like to understand the progression that led to that person's current voice. And um, it's going to be interesting. Now, but before I get much further into this, let me just make sure that the audio and everything is working because once bitten, twice shy, three times traumatized, we should be live on Rumble, which we are. We should be live on locals, which we are. Um, now let's 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 rant a little bit before we bring in Natalie. I um, have always been reluctant of putting people, putting you know, putting institutions on what's called putting them on blast. Typically, what putting someone on blast means means making public something which was not supposed to be public or not intended to be public. Uh, I think it's since morphed into taking something which was intended to be public and giving it a bigger bullhorn than they apparently wanted in the first place. I've always been reluctant about that when I had on um, uh, Rachik from Libs of TikTok. And I asked her, you know, like, you take these videos that people post on TikTok and you amplify them. Do you feel a little, you know, potentially guilty about it? In that you're bringing a lot more attention to the person than they might have ever thought they were going to get, even though they posted a video to the public on TikTok, and she had a very good um, answer, which, you know, is the steel man of the answer. No, they wanted this. They shared a message with the world. They made something public. You can't then say, I made it public, but you made it more public. I uh, have returned to Canada for the summer. I'm doing the loops, doing the tours, you know, saying hi to friends and, 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 and everything. And I drive by this school which is on, uh, it's on a main thoroughfare in Montreal. It's not, this is not like, you know, tucked up in the middle of nowhere, a private school that they're, you know, this is on a main thoroughfare. It's a school called The Study, uh, showing off how, I guess, progressive, how tolerant they are, posting in Canada, by the way, it's called the 2S LGBTQIA+. 2S is two-spirit, LGBTQ. The A, uh, which I see sometimes and sometimes don't see, stands for asexual, as if this is the type of discussion we should have, be having with, you know, elementary school girls. Asexual, queer, trans, what's the intersex? And the plus? Well, if the plus is for everything, what do you need the other letters for? But that, I, I'm, I'm tangent. The study, front and, front and proud, a massive trans flag, it's an all-girls elementary private school. I think it's elementary. It's an all-girls school. Just let this sink in. Do you think there's any parents of the girls at that all-girls school that might say, I'm not on board with all of this, but they can't say it because they might get ostracized and demonized and their kids are going to be the, the black sheep in the school? It's an all-girls school celebrating trans inclusivity while discriminating on the basis of the sex that they are denying by floating that flag. Maybe some people are going to say they're not denying biology. They're just showing inclusivity. All right, do they let boys into that school? Are they going to let biological boys, and I'm not even going to say bio, are they going to let boys into that school so that boys with their boy penis parts are going to be in bathrooms and changing rooms with the all girls, girls private parts? Oh, but they, and, and they post it public for the world because they are proud of it. They post it publicly to the world so that everybody should see it. And then if someone puts it on blast or shares their, um, discontent with the message, well, then they're the bigots, they're the intolerance. Just leave us alone, leave us be. Before I bring in that, I want to I I I share this one. This is just the absurdity of the clown world in which we are currently living. And then we're going to get to to Natalie, who I, I go back and watch everybody's first video. 
to see their trans transformation over the long, you know, over the life of the interwebs. Her first video, which was you want to unify and you want to, you know, speak respectfully and disagree publicly and disagree politely. Uh, we'll see how that's working out because I'm not sure that that's possible anymore because silence is violence and disagreeing with the, the, the religion of the day, the cult of the day is itself bigotry, discrimination, uh, intolerance. This is from John Pavlovitz. I don't know who this person is. Author of If God is Love, Don't Be a Jerk um, puts out a tweet and it says this, and I'm not, this is, this is reality, people. Dear phobic Christians, not phobic Muslims, not phobic Jews. The only people you can pick on publicly these days, it would seem, the only, the only group you can discriminate against based on ideology seems to be Christians. But maybe I'm just uh, oversimplifying. Leave LGBTQ people alone. I mean, it's, it's literally like the leave Britney alone meme in real time. And this is what the meme says. Dear phobic Christian, I don't know how you ended up deciding that anyone else's body, gender identity, or sexual orientation were any of your business. They aren't. Oh, I'm sorry, Pavlovitz. Let me just see where, if, if, if ever, my, my, my tweet is going to be here. You, you, you don't know where uh, people started thinking that someone else's gender, uh, whatever, was part of your, your business? It became our business when it was rubbed in our face every day of the week for an entire month. And, and I say this, I don't care. It, I, I, you know, you want to show off and you want to say who you are, that's fine. You want to then say, it's none of your business. Well, I, I can't find my tweet, but it's none of your business when it's flying on the top of Parliament Hill, when it's uh, on baseball fields, hockey rinks, when it's on every single corporate thing you can imagine. It's, it's none of your business. I don't know where you got off thinking it's any of your business. I don't want to hear you talk about it, but shut up and stare at the, stare at the flag and, 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 and worship it. And don't talk about it. Don't criticize it because we're showing you what we think and we don't want to hear what you think. Um, no, hold on. I, I think I might, I think I might have to show the, the, um, I'll, I'll show it just before. Okay. Okay. And, and then we're really going to be done. And then I, then I said, I promise that's it. Then I'm bringing in Natalie because she's been, I see her in the backdrop politely. I'm not sure if she's, I'm not sure if I'm like setting this up for, she's now uncomfortable that she agreed to come on. Here we go. When a group literally flies it on government buildings, here you go. Check it out. This is a uh, Illinois state capital. Um, in schools, sporting events, music, movies, television, everywhere in consumer markets, they literally make it everyone else's business. You're going to say you get to do, you, a group gets to do this, and I don't get to say maybe it's not appropriate uh, pushing this stuff on kids. Maybe it's not appropriate um, flying this stuff at all girls' schools. And I think I'm fairly certain it's elementary. Look at this. So none of our business. I, I, he, this guy doesn't know where we got off thinking it was any of our business. If, if it were left at, let adults be adults. No one would care. I have plenty of gay and lesbian friends. I actually have a lot of people stop me on the street saying they're fans who then willingly tell me they are gay or lesbian. Um, nobody, nobody cares what consenting adults do among themselves. That We are well beyond that. Like I said before, Pride Month is now no longer seemingly about tolerance. It's about dominance. Okay, that's my intro, people. Share the link around. This is going to be fantastic. Okay, Natalie. Let's see if Natalie is now immediately regretting this decision. I'm bringing you in in three, two, one. Sorry, I went, I went a little longer than I said I would. Do I back this out like this? I think the spacing is better. Here. I, we this? I think so. <laughs> it was very zoomed in for a moment, and I was alarmed. So. The thing is here. <laughs> it, I, I can, when I bring up when I bring up highlighted comments, it won't um, it won't interfere with our screen. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, Natalie, sorry, I, I hope I have not. I think you're familiar with my content, so you, you, this comes as a surprise. Um, no, I'm glad to be here. Th thank you for coming. This is okay. It's amazing because I saw I don't know how it happened. A few videos popped up on my feed. I watched a couple, and then I get a lot more, and I'm like, very interesting of an individual. And then I did a little homework, and then I said I'd love to have you on to see you know understand exactly where you're coming from. For those who don't know who you are. I see the 30,000 foot overview before we delve into childhood and how you had this awakening or transformation. Mm -hmm. um, well, I like to say uh, 2020 changed my life. I don't, I don't know about anyone else. And uh, I, I was for a very long time a uh, liberal atheist, definitely a Democrat my whole life. And um, very organically and accidentally, I'm now a conservative Christian political content creator. So... 
Um, I yeah. let me. I, I've learned not to ask the the question, which apparently I'm not allowed qu asking. But what is your favorite uh, childhood sitcom growing up? My favorite childhood sitcom. Um, I really liked Family Matters. I think is the name of it. Yes, Family Matters with Winslow and. Or Steve Urkel, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> and now, Full now, House. Full now, House too. now I'm able, I'm able to um, orient your age by way of decade. That's as, that's as yes. much as I'm going to ask. Um, so where were you born and where were you raised? I was born in uh, Orange County, California. And right. I was raised there. I've been in California my whole life. I now live in Los Angeles. All right. Orange County. Um, as far, now, so for those who don't understand or don't know, is Orange County a reddish county within the otherwise blue state of California or is orange County like bluer than bluer than the sky? No, no. I mean, it was red for a while. I, I should preface all this with saying that prior to 2020, I didn't know what the heck was going on. I wasn't politically involved. I was just Democrat by default, but um, I think prior to the 2018 midterms, orange County was um, definably red. And then it's, it's now a little bit more purple. But definitely more red than Los Angeles, where I currently live. Yeah. All right. And uh, if I may ask, sibling wise, are you are there many children? Are you an only child? I'm in the middle, which is probably why I was an actor for a long time. But uh, uh, in the middle of how many? <laughs> I have two siblings. Uh, okay. I, there's three of us. So okay. an older sister and a younger brother. And what, if I may ask, and you'll tell me when to shut up and stop asking, what did your parents do growing up, and what was your childhood like? Um, my father was a real estate agent while I was growing up and my mom, um, I'm very blessed. She was able to stay home, uh, worked sometimes off and on odd jobs at like Walmart, but for the most part, she was there during my childhood, which I really appreciate. Uh, and growing up, um, I, I had a, a good childhood. I was a weird kid. I would do weird. I wanted to be a nun for a really long time. I would put myself in timeout <laughs> um, whenever I thought I had done something bad, even if I had just thought it, like it came into my head. Um, I would put myself in timeout and I would dress up like the Virgin Mary around the house. I would put like, I had a, a nightgown and like a matching house coat and I would tie the house coat around my head and uh, under my chin. And I thought it was like a veil. Um, I think my parents were either alarmed or really, really like relieved that that was <laughs> what I was going to grow up to do, but I did not grow up to do that. So uh, did you grow up in a religion? I mean, I know that Christianity plays a, a, a oh, I don't want to say plays a central role, but it's an important factor in, in who you are now growing up. Were you brought up religious? Yes. Uh, my family's Catholic and I actually um, was blessed enough to go to Catholic school. I was confirmed. I, I did all the sacraments up to a confirmation um, when I was about 16. Uh, but then I left the church when I was around 18 or 19. Um, and I've only recently returned to, uh, to Jesus, not necessarily uh, to Catholicism, but yes. Now forgive the naive questions of the secular Jew of the, you've done the sacraments. What does that mean exactly? Oh, well, there's infant baptism in the Catholic church and then, um, first Holy communion. Okay. Uh, where you first take obviously the body of Christ and then confirmation. Yeah. I'm going <laughs> to show how long I've been out of the church, I guess. But it's uh, sort of, I mean, it happens when you're 14, 15, 16, but uh, reaffirming your faith in uh, the Catholic church and uh, you choose a patron saint to sort of guide you through it. I'm probably butchering it, but it's sort of like now I'm no longer an infant. I'm no longer, uh, I think first like communion is first grade. And now I'm more of an adult, quote unquote, and I am deciding for myself that this is my, my belief. Okay. Yeah, very interesting. And um, grow it. So you went to a cat. I, I presume it was a private school if it's a religious school. Yes. All yes. right. All girls are <laughs> speaking of introductions. <laughs> I not like the school you, yeah, not like that. Okay. I'm sure there's a, I think there's some now actually that are Catholic. I mean, that's a whole tangential thing, but you know, Catholic school is not what it was. I went during a good time and I, I'm grateful that I went to school when I did because this stuff that I see is crazy. So someone asks, what is your confirmation name? Um, so my, my uh, St. Joan of Arc was, uh, the saint that I chose. So oh. I think it's sort of like Natalie Joan Beisner. Okay. Well, <laughs> no. hold on. That, that, I, I don't know I'm much. Really I'm probably messing this up. I'm what? sorry. I'm not, it's 16 was a long time ago. <laughs> well, that, first of all, no, that, I mean, that's, that's good enough. I mean, that's, that's already, that leads to another question. I know who Joan of Arc was. Did, yes. Were you allowed to pick your own name or was that picked for you by people who do your, your, your character? You pick a saint that sort of speaks to you. 
Okay. You choose yourself. And so at 16, you pick Joan of Arc. And yeah. I won't ask how many years ago that was, but lo and behold, today, you might be fighting a Joan of Arc type battle. Uh, that is a big, I cannot say that I agree with that. <laughs> I'm going to humbly plead the fifth, but some days it feels like it, you know. All right. So I, I hope I'm doing the Lord's work. Sometimes I have to question, like, I don't know, am I just down in the mud wrestling in the gutter with people and maybe I should just log should off? I said, shut, shut up and sit down as, uh, yeah. what's her face said? Um, oh, what's her name? The Hawaiian, uh, Congresswoman. Her no chat's going to get it. Shut men, shut up and sit down. Um, okay. well, I'll, I'll wait for I don't know if I know that <laughs> chat. Hold on a second. Who's going to get it faster? Rumble or rumble or YouTube. I uh, will get it in a second. No, it wasn't Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, Pono. It was, um, Hanu, Hanunu, the, the, the Hawaiian, the Hawaiian, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, okay, we'll get there in a second. She so you, told someone to shut up and sit down. Is it was that in the context what? of it was in the context of um, uh, the debate on women's rights, and she says mm. men need to shut up and sit down. It wasn't yes, Gabbard, yeah. people. Uh, okay, so you do you do private school? What do you do for university? What do you study? How do you get into acting? And how do you get out of acting? Uh, well, I was I started acting in high school. I'm I'm very shy. I still am. Um, and uh, I just kind of discovered I love theater. I I feel very very betrayed by theater in Hollywood. Um, I'm so grateful I was not an actor during COVID and I, I don't want to go back to acting, but uh, I can only imagine if that had still been my dream during the response to COVID because I have friends who are still in the industry and it was it was horrible. Um, and I still feel a little bit of betrayal because I want to go back to theater as a patron and, it, and it's hard. But um, yeah, I got on stage in high school and I just realized I could be a different person than than who I was and, and maybe get out of my shell a little bit. I was painfully shy. And uh, I went to university in San Francisco for a year, um, had some health problems and had to come back and then ended up going to Cal State Fullerton. And I uh, went a little later in life than I, I thought I would have gone to college. But uh, it ended up working out. They had a wonderful theater program at the time. It was very a very competitive theater program. And uh, I wouldn't change it at all, even though I'm no longer pursuing it, because I think, <laughs> I mean, as, as far as worthless degrees go, it's, it's probably that, you know, but uh, I think that it, it makes me who I am today. I'm, I'm sure I'm using some of those communication skills, you know, being able to express myself. So, um, yeah, and uh, I pursued it for a long time, about six or seven years in Los Angeles. And honestly, I just realized that, I mean, number one, I still, I'm very shy. So it's as a lot of actors are, but it's a challenge to audition every day. And that's what I realized mostly is that when you are professionally pursuing acting, your job is auditioning and your vacation is booking. And so you basically have to be okay with the fact that your nine to five sometimes nine to whenever, very late at night, all sorts of weird things, um, you know, nothing, nothing inappropriate or illegal, but just you're constantly auditioning. And that is what you do every day. And it's not paid work, obviously, it's it's sometimes thankless work. And I would just feel very much like, I don't really know what I did today. Did I help anyone? Did I touch any lives? And um, it wasn't for me. And, and part of it, a very small part of it, and this sort of plays into my story of walking away, um, in retrospect, I can see that now. Uh, a small part of it, not the main part of it, but a small part of it was Hollywood and at theater, which I, like I said, I really love, is so, I mean, it's racial diversity above everything else. It's whatever's going on in the culture, like Hollywood, it feels like it did it first and it did it 10 times more, you know? So the response to COVID, everything, which like I said, I had left prior to COVID. But I remember in 2017, 2018, you know, um, that's when I first remember hearing these phrases like white privilege and seeing this push for racial diversity above everything, above talent. I mean, talent comes in all colors, but just above, it, 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 there's only one kind of story that wanted to be told or that was going to be told. And I noticed that even while I was still so deeply entrenched in the left and it didn't cause me to walk away. I, I ended up leaving Hollywood for a lot of reasons. That was one of them. Um, but it was something that clicked in my mind of like, this doesn't sit right with me. And I don't know that I belong with these people. Um, and it's interesting because it took me a few more years to actually do anything about it. But that was something that, that like I said, didn't sit right with me. And um, for a lot of reasons, I stopped pursuing. You, yeah. you did a year in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. What year was that? Uh, right out of high school. Okay. So like so we're I was talking, there. 
early early 2010s or late 2000s? No, uh, 2008 or nine, I think. What and what was the city like? I mean, I don't know if you've gone back since. What was the city like then? And if you've gone back since, uh, do you have a comparison? I haven't been back since. Thank God. Um, was, was it was it a, was it was it the Dave Rubin esque or what Dave Rubin shows us it is today? Was it like that then or? Not, not I've heard it's gotten place. worse. You know, I was really sick uh, that year. I was I was struggling with some mental and uh, physical problems. Um, I'm, I I had a pretty bad eating disorder, and I stayed inside a lot, so I really didn't experience it um, too much, which is part of why I came home. But I think I was there when Gavin Newsom. I think that was his tenure as mayor of San Francisco. So <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure it wasn't great. But I've heard it's really really devolved, and I I couldn't. I honestly couldn't tell you what it was like then. Okay, we're going to end on YouTube. We're going to go over to Rumble, and I'm going to see if I can ask a question that might. You'll let me know if I if I ask too many questions. I'm um, open. Well, because I, I want to get the, the eating disorder, and then mm -hmm. having decided to make yourself physically and psychologically bare to the world, it seems like a very risky decision or risky choice yeah. to have made. I'm going to end this on YouTube, everybody. The link is up there. Uh, head on over to Rumble in five seconds. I hold on before I do that. I should, my, my brother said, Dave, you don't tell people what you're doing. Everybody watching now, we start on YouTube and rumble. I have an exclusive agreement with rumble, which means I end on YouTube so that this can be exclusively on rumble, the free speech platform. And then I post clips to Viva clips or the entire stream to Viva fry on YouTube tomorrow. So you get, you all get it on YouTube, but just after the fact. So we're going to go over to rumble. Now it's Viva fry on rumble as well. Now everybody knows what's happening and I'm ending it on YouTube. Go over there. I can, explore this a lot more because bearing yourself naked to the world on the internet is not for the faint of heart and it's not for the sensitive and it's certainly not for those who might have past trauma we're going to get into that mm -hmm. now okay ending on youtube done changes nothing on our end natalie okay if i can pry a little bit um the eating disorder do i presume bulimia anorexia or or something different if I may. Yes, I, I know I'm comfortable talking about it. I actually wrote about it a lot before I started making political content. So I guess I have a penchant for bearing myself <laughs> to the world. Um, yeah, I, I would periodically starve myself and then I abused, uh, I binge, binge eating and uh, abused laxatives for a very long time. I mean, in, in, a, in a pretty severe, uh, I'm, I'm aware that there are <laughs> worse problems to have. And, and this, I think from an outsider sort of seems like when you bring on yourself, it's very hard to understand, but it was pretty severe. And I thought it was going to uh, kill me for a long time because I couldn't stop. And, and, and first of all, uh, anybody who looks at one form of mental illness or mental crisis and says it's brought on, but others are natural, like there are yeah. chemical imbalances, but then mm -hmm. some people might just say that all forms of these, all forms of issues are, you know, to some extent, chemical imbalances. Mm -hmm. uh, so you would, you would uh, say not eat so that you would lose weight. But then if you binge ate, the idea would be to overdose or, or, or bone up on laxatives so that it comes out faster and you absorb yes. less. Yes. And that is why I did not make it out to San Francisco very much <laughs> the one year I was there um, uh, because I was busy doing other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, no, I know where I'm not going to ask the TMI question, but all right. So, so, well, let me, if I may just ask you this, when do you, when do you know that this is a problem that you have to address for yourself? Does it require external interventions or if you come to the acknowledgement yourself, what do you do to actually extend and ask somebody for help? You know, I'm sort of a rare case from my understanding. Um, I fixed myself. Um, I'm still on a journey to fix myself. I, I, I have an inkling it's a lifelong journey, but I was able to cure myself of my eating disorder, which is, I think, very rare. Um, but I, it started in high school, got really bad when I was in San Francisco. I came home and um, at one point around 20 or 21, I uh, I just started reading self-help books. It sounds so trite. And I also, I'm no longer vegan, but I became vegan, which really, for ethical reasons, uh, which I no longer hold uh, dear. But it helped me, I guess, to have some sort of, to connect food with some kind of, I don't know whether this is healthy or not, but to connect food with some sort of uh, something greater than me. And so uh, then it was no longer about abusing food, abusing myself, uh, using food as punishment. It was like, I'm going to eat this way because it aligns with my values. I, I care about the animals. And for some reason that helped me. So I, I, I do sort of believe that there's different diets for everyone because veganism holds a special place in my heart, although I very much uh, love to eat animal products now. Um, so it sounds very weird, but it was a very, it was a really challenging struggle. I mean, I could not stop 
I would spend all my money on food and I couldn't stop uh, binging and purging, honestly. And I, I really feel for people who are in that cycle because it's, it's horrible. Well, I mean, some, I'll, I'll say that if you have self-help books and, and you're not doing it on your own, it's, you know, people go to therapists and that's nothing but a talking self-help book. Mm -hmm. And then some people go to mental medications, which I, in my, in my uh, very naive superficial understanding of things is probably not the best way to go, but might be the most reflexive because it's the easiest for most people. Something external, just heal me internally instead of doing it internally which takes work and which takes daily work. It's not something that yeah. happens on its own. I think at a certain point, I got tired of my own, you know, BS at a certain point. And I don't know, I think, I, I do feel like, and this is kind of what happened to me in 2022, you have to, a lot of times humans have to suffer before you change it all. And I definitely had to suffer. It just got to a point where this is, this is going to end me or I'm going to end it. And so I, I did it, but it took, it took some years, unfortunately. And so you, 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 you leave San Francisco, you go home, uh, help yourself to get help. Uh, and then you go back to, uh, not journalism, sorry, you go back to acting school. Where was it again? I went to Cal State Fullerton. Before that, I did a lot of community theater where I really learned a lot. I mean, it's great. There's like this very vibrant, I hope it's still there. I don't, I don't really know anymore, especially after COVID, but there's this vibrant community theater uh, community in Orange County where people just, you know, they have their day job and then they do this at night and they love it. And I, there's so many talented people who you've never heard of who are actors, you know, and it's, I, I, I just look back on those years very fondly. I learned a lot. No, Natalie, it, will, will it embarrass you if I bring up your IMBD? <laughs> let, let me do, uh, let me I'm do only this. laughing because people bring it up, uh, I know. trolls bring it up to hate on me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had to, because I'm looking through the troll replies and people, I don't know if it's a gotcha, I don't know what the movie is, but hold on, let, let me refresh. <laughs> Because it's it's this picture where I don't know. Yeah. First of all, so you're an actress. You, you did some you did some you did some movies. I don't know what that was, but what is the gotcha that people think they're getting you on by posting that image? Was it a was it a horrible? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Lurid? Was it a an, a, a an awful, disgusting movie, or do people just think they're embarrassing you by showing you? images of your youth or younger i think i think you know as is the real the greatest real in the world no um but it's out there you know you're not exactly colombo finding my imdb <laughs> there look i i did i will say this for myself i did a lot of theater i love theater um and i uh maybe i'm more I think i have a little bit more of a presence on stage than on camera well, but on camera it's really easy to like I don't know, pick yourself and pick other people apart. So but the, the movie, it's not like you did a, a Satan movie, which juxtaposes no. with your Christian beliefs. The, the, the movie no. itself was not, a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, disgustingly immoral. It's just people no. think that they're And even if it was, you know, I'd, I have done a lot of stuff that juxtaposes with who I am today. And I'm, I'm honest about that, that I was a liberal atheist uh, Democrat, you know, not that Democrat is necessarily part of it, but it plays a part in my story. And now I'm not. So I'm not uh, ashamed of anything. I didn't just fall from heaven, you know, in 2020 with all of my beliefs <laughs> implanted inside myself. So, I, you know, there's nothing out there that someone's going to, you know, make me well, feel I saw, I saw the troll. I didn't understand what the purpose of the troll was because I hadn't seen the movie. Um, now, the question I wanted to ask you for my own personal knowledge, you're doing uh, auditions in Hollywood. You're, you're doing mm -hmm. the, the scene. What, is, what, is, what does that life look like? Are you living in a you know stereotypical small apartment, doing multiple auditions a day while working a job that you don't like just so that you can keep auditioning? It is exactly like that. Yeah. It takes a special kind of person. Um, and it's, it's like, you know, La La Land and except without the Ryan Gosling part. I mean, it's like, it's like every movie, you know, any portrayal of actors, that is what I experienced. And it really is a thankless job. You know, I had so many strange experiences going in and auditioning. Um, when, when <laughs> this one's story stands out of, I had an appointment to audition. They had seen my photo. They had seen my reel, which, you know, we all agree is uh, decent, you know, but uh, possibly terrible in some people's eyes, but they called me into audition. And then um, when I was in the waiting room, they came out and said, "Never mind, you know, we don't we don't need to see you. So it's stuff like that, where I drove through Hollywood at rush hour traffic parked. And then you had already seen my face, already seen whatever I look like. And then suddenly you don't want me in the room. You know, it's it's a very people treat actors either justifiably or not very poorly. And you do, it takes a indomitable spirit and you've got to really, really want this. And 
having tasted a tiny fraction of it by having my walk away video go a little bit viral, you know, I'm still a, a nobody, but uh, I don't think I would want, I don't think I, I'm glad I didn't pursue the acting because gosh, it's, it's hard to be under that microscope and have people searching through your dark interwebs of your past. I mean, I, yes, I, I admire people who pursue it. Not knowing exactly how it works, but I have something of an idea. When you have those, they're not called press kits, but your bios and you and you send them out and it's got a picture and it's got your credentials. Uh, I'm going to ask the indiscreet question. I don't need the answer, but does it also, do you also put like height and those physical attributes on the thing? So it's not like you show up and you're either six feet tall or five feet tall and they're wildly surprised? No, you do. You put your height and you're always supposed to have a photo that matches your physical appearance now. So yeah, I'm not really sure what happened with that. The, funnily enough, I, I was working in restaurants uh, in 2019, 2020, when this when COVID happened. And the producer from that, the poor girl who had to come out and tell me, she was so embarrassed, you know, never mind, yeah, we're actually good today. She she recognized me in, uh, while I was waiting tables and she apologized. And this was at least a year and a half later. So in the end, it worked out. But uh, I don't, I still don't know what happened with that. But it's just, it's little things like that where, it's like you give up your time and you're you're basically making a fool of yourself and being incredibly vulnerable in front of strangers all day long. And uh, that's a hard ask. Um, I'm going to ask the other question, which is the nosy one. We know of what we call the debauchery, depravity, all of the nasty stuff from the Harvey, Harvey Weinstein pinnacle of the nastiness to the, you know, the, the more indiscreet stuff as a young woman, uh, you know, who looks like how you look. Was that ever, was that an experience that you had, you know, you'll get the job if that sort of uh, disgusting aspect of, of the seediness of Hollywood? No, no, it wasn't. I, I honestly, I don't think I was in big enough rooms uh, for better or worse to, mm. to experience that. I've, I've experienced uh, far worse as I think we all have uh, online. So I, I did not experience that part of Hollywood, but I'm sure it's real. Well, we're, we're, we're going to get there as well. <laughs> now, I'm trying to find your walk away video. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to find it quickly enough, but if you have it and you can send it to me, then you don't, and you don't mind us watching it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's very lengthy, but I definitely have it on my, um, it's on my rumble on my Twitter. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll say, I'll go, well, if you find it quickly, then you can flip it to me and we'll, we'll snip it. We'll play a little piece of that. Um, are you, you're, I mean, was your walk away part of, um, I can't believe I forget his freaking name now. Brandon. Oh, Brandon Strzok. I'm sorry. And I've, I've had him on the channel. Was this part of the, um, was this part of the same movement? Well, he's been um, very welcoming. He, uh, I think I'm sending um, my walkway video to you now over Twitter, oh, but okay. uh, in DM. Um, yeah, he's been very welcoming. He walked away a lot, much earlier than I did. I think it was, I'm, I'm going to probably mess it up, 60. five or six years ago. Yeah. And it's a huge movement. And he's sort of like, he was the head of this movement, still is. And now he has his own social media for Walkaway. It's a social media app where you can go on and share your Walkaway video. So he is what inspired me to film that because he okay. started this app. He was calling for videos. And even though this story takes place in 2020, I filmed it just a couple of weeks ago. And I wouldn't have done it if it had not been for Brandon. Okay. Now, hold on. I'm pulling it up, people. Uh let me see here because the not not that the, the, it's a it's a big american flag of a backdrop here hold on we'll watch just one second of this i think this is it right here yeah this is it good okay here we're not playing the whole thing but we'll i'll share it with the chat what bothered me the most was that these people absolutely refused to acknowledge that i might have any honest reason for disagreeing with them and that felt like a punch in the gut especially on top of the fact that I couldn't go to work, but I was being encouraged to go out and protest. I'm Natalie Beisner. I am a conservative Christian and a political content creator. But before that, I was an atheist Democrat for a long time, and I didn't know anything about politics. That That is as much as we're going to play now. I, I know the, soul, the Thomas Sowell quote, which is, uh, what is it? That some people assume that nobody has any honest reason for disagreeing with them. Yes, one of the most pathetic and dangerous signs of our times is the growing number of individuals and groups that believe no one can have any honest reason for disagreeing with them. Paraphrasing a bit, but yeah. that's uh, something that stuck out with me from the moment that I started speaking out two years ago, and it's it's why I speak out still. So now, speaking out two years ago is post-COVID, and I think COVID, well, I think Trump was the first thing that broke a lot of people's minds and broke a lot of people's psychological barriers, and then COVID happened, yes. and then it made people realize just how corrupt and disgusting 
every every layer of, of society is. What were you, who, who did you, if I may ask, I never asked this, I won't ask it. Politically 2016, where were you? I drove a hundred miles round trip just to vote for Hillary Clinton for president. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now good. I'm, I'm glad I share I that in the video. I mean, that gives you an idea of how politically motivated I wasn't even registered in the right county, but I was so so with her. And I remember going into the booth. It was when they still had booths, and it wasn't all digital now. And I feel like everyone can see the screen. But and I just voted for her. I didn't know anything else on the ballot, and I turned right around and went home. That was the extent of my political involvement. So, let me and let me ask this: like, you, you do this? Is it is it because your parents did it? Is it because we all thought you're if if you're you are liberal because you vote liberal? You are progressive if you vote Democrat. Like what what where did the indoctrination come from? As far as you're concerned, um, not my parents. My parents are more Republican leaning, and in fact, I'm grateful because I hated Donald Trump right up through basically mid 2020. And I couldn't tell you why. And I want to, it's embarrassing to say, but I am a critical thinker. I'm an intelligent person, but it did not extend as far as politics. And I just completely bought, I still have criticisms of Donald Trump, but I just bought everything that they wanted me to believe. I saw the clips exactly how they wanted me to see them. And I thought, you know, racist, sexist, everything. And I just took it as gospel truth. And, but my father is, uh, was a Trump supporter in 2016, especially. And so I'm grateful for that because it kept me a little bit grounded because everything that they were saying about Trump supporters is not true of my father. So even though I vehemently disagreed with him, I was able at least to recognize, okay, well, they're not all this way. And some of what they're saying is not true. And I, I'm grateful for that because it, it kept me a little bit sane because I really hated Donald Trump. Um, but no, so it wasn't because of my parents. I think it's just really easy to be accidentally, peripherally Democrat, you know, especially in Southern California, especially having been an actress for so long. Um, and I just, you know, I thought compassionate people vote Democrat and Democrats are compassionate people. And I just, I didn't, I didn't question it. I didn't have any reason to question it, unfortunately, uh, before 2020. And then in 2020, it affected my life. It was visceral. Uh, these Democrat policies, and not that Republicans didn't have a hand in them across the nation, um, but it was certainly, I'm in a Democrat stronghold, and we had some of the longest co response to COVID uh, in the nation. And so I couldn't uh, turn away from it anymore. Well, it, it, the circular reasoning or the tautological reasoning, some people say, you know, your parents indoctrinated you into it if you're politically aligned. And if you're not, then so they'll say, okay, well, you voted the way you did because you're rebelling against your father's pro-Trump stance. Um, but and it's interesting you say also you know your Democrats are compassionate and if you're compassionate you vote Democrat mm -hmm. and it's 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 in the branding I mean it's, it is mm -hmm. just in the branding it's the same thing in yeah. Canada you're liberal if you vote liberal and you're tolerant if you do and you do because you're tolerant vote for Justin right. Trudeau and then at some point in your conscious existence you realize that perhaps it's the exact opposite or just perhaps um, there's ugliness on all aspects of, of politics mm -hmm. 2016 you vote Hillary. You see what happens 2016 to 2020, your political awakening occurred as of COVID or did it start occurring a little bit before, after you saw what the media and what the world did once Trump got elected? No, I was totally on board with what the media and the world was doing when Trump was elected. Um, again, I wasn't paying attention, but I, I bought it all. And if he would ask me if he was a Russian agent, I probably would have said yes, based off of nothing. Um, no, it's it happened in summer 2020. Summer 2020 changed my life. Um, when COVID happened, you know, 2019 was a hard year for my my family um, for financial reasons. I, I help out some family members financially sometimes. And 2019 was a specifically rough year. And then basically at the start of 2020, I lost my jobs. And uh, that was hard for me um, because I need to work, which uh, before 2020, I would have thought was just understood sort of universally, but it, it seems that it's not. Um, and so it, it caused me concern initially, but I want to make it very clear, I was on board with the response to COVID at first. Um, I think there's this idea that anyone who was an early dissenter against lockdowns, which I was relatively speaking, was was immediately upset. And God bless those people, because I think they have a keener eye than I do. And they were more aware of red flags than I was. But I wasn't one of those people. I wanted to do my quote unquote part. I stayed home. I wore a mask in the grocery store. I didn't see my family. I had a weird roommate situation and uh, still stayed home. Um, and then summer 2020, um, when the unrest over the of Floyd's death happened, um, you know, some of them being peaceful protests, some of them not, including in Los Angeles, that the response to the BLM unrest 
compared to the response to COVID, I felt like a punch in the gut. I thought it was crazy. I it, it blew my mind because I had already started to have questions about the response to COVID because at that point, you know, it was already two months in, at least two and a half months. And uh, obviously we were told two weeks to slow the spread. And there were some things going on, like the arrows on the grocery store floor and uh, my park being caution taped off, like the exercise machines, you know, the body weight machines, which are already six feet apart. We're out in the California, Los Angeles sun. And I'm not a scientist, which people like to remind me, I'm not a doctor, but it didn't make sense to me. Um, and also I, I mentioned in that walk away video, I would take these long walks around LA. I didn't have a car. Um, we've already established I struggle like a lot of people with mental health sometimes and I didn't have jobs. So I would take these walks and uh, I never wore a mask outside. I didn't see the point of it. But if I saw anyone anywhere coming near me at all, I would get I'll go across the street for that person or that group of people or at least get off the sidewalk. And people would stop and tell me what a terrible person I was. They would yell at me. And and that <laughs> that blew my mind, you know, because it was so clear to me that something bigger than what we were being told was going on. And sometimes, you know, that would be, I mean, I'm not asking for sympathy because I could have just put on a dang mask to go on a walk um, and solved all this, but it would be my only human interaction for the day sometimes because I was following the rules. I had given up my jobs. Um, no one was telling me when I would get them back. I never got those jobs back. And whenever I brought up the questions I had about COVID, I was told basically to sit down and shut up and that I was being selfish. Um, and so those things had started happening already. And then Floyd, the Floyd's death happened. And I saw doctors sign letters, not all of them, but I remember reading in the New York Times, doctors mm -hmm. signing a letter saying, don't shut down these protests. They're a historical moment. And I absolutely support your First Amendment right to peacefully protest. However, I had a problem with the fact that the the Democrat and a lot of Republicans too at the time, but the Democrat leaders in my city and in my state who were telling me I was going to die of COVID, all of the talking heads on corporate media who were telling me I was going to die of COVID, um, the doctors, you know, many of them were telling me I was going to die of COVID, but then they support these protests. And I watched these protests um, on the news and, I, you know, I had an idea that I, we had an idea even at the time that probably outdoors was safe, but it was large groups of people gathered together, oftentimes unmasked. And again, you know, you want to peacefully protest, go ahead and do it. But it was the hypocrisy of bolstering these protests, even as we condemn anti-lockdown protests and uh, tell you that you're going to die. And at one point, Los Angeles was in a curfew, nightly curfew due to peaceful protests on top of a lockdown. And I just thought this is not good. I mean, this is an absolute insanity for the entire community. I'm bringing, I'm bringing up the article, New York Times, are protests dangerous? This is from, where's the date? July 6, 2020. Are protests dangerous? What experts say may depend on who's protesting what. Can you, I mean, I, mean, I, I think I had, I had um, turned a lot earlier than that. The BLM protest was, became a source of contention between me and some friends who were like, mm -hmm. just trust the experts. And I was, I, I stopped trusting the experts when they were padlocking outdoor dog runs in April, 2020. Um, but again, you know, at some point you try to be polite and you try to be non-confrontational, non-opinionated because you think that's how you make enemies. Mm -hmm. I think that that changes once you realize that silence is violence and you'll make enemies by not saying anything. And so you may exactly. as well say, you may as well say what you believe. So that was the beginning of your awakening, so to speak. Yes. Yes. Are you familiar with Alex Jones? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, jokes yeah. aside. He was right. I'm just kidding. I'm just... <laughs> Hashtag canceled, Natalie. Okay. So <laughs> you start having this awakening. Uh, the question I was having that I just forgot because I'm an idiot. So what's your progression now? So this we're, we're the summer of 2020. You realize this, do, it does not make any sense to say, can you protest? Well, that depends who's protesting what. Donald Trump uh, political rally, super spreader. BLM, mm -hmm. racism is a public health crisis. Right. Therefore, it's justified. What, yeah. what did you start doing in response to or in protest of, or just as a pure personal evolution to this? Well, um, first I want to say, and we kind of touched on it a little bit at the, in that video uh, that you played of mine. Um, I do want to be clear that it, what bothered me really was was not even that we disagreed necessarily, because at the time, I'm willing to give a little bit of a grace. It was, it was still very new, um, even though it was so clear to me that this is wrong. But I know everyone was scared and whatnot, so I'm willing to extend a little bit of grace here. But what bothered me was, like I said, whenever I brought up 
my concerns whenever I saw other people bringing up concerns because I wasn't the only one. Um, I was told I was selfish and I was told I was racist. So again, it goes back to that Thomas Sowell quote of you cannot possibly disagree for any honest reason. You can't possibly have a problem being locked in your home and having your jobs taken away other than the fact that you're selfish and a racist. And that really bothered me. And I gave the Democrats, I gave the people who I had supported all my life like a chance to address my concerns at all. And they didn't. And it wasn't just like a little blip on the radar of, oh, we lost our minds summer 2020, please forgive us. Mm uh los angeles had vaccine passports which i saw coming from a mile away at that point i knew this wasn't going to be voluntary um i apart from the jobs i lost due to the lockdowns i had to lose jobs because i wasn't going to take the vaccine uh, i wasn't allowed in you know bars and restaurants in my city which god knows there are worse things than that but i mean it blows my mind as long as i'm alive we'll never forget what happens like i i'm not going to become bitter about it but in my lifetime in the United States, we went back to legalize segregation on the basis of something other than gender. And I pray to God that no one ever forgets that because that is horrible. It is how awful things in history start. I think we should all know that by now. And, uh, you know, we had a mass mandate through March of 2022. So it was I was proven correct in my my walking away because it just it got worse and more insane. So it wasn't just a little blip on the radar. But um I, to get where I am now, you know, it wasn't overnight. I did not decide, okay, well, I've been burned. So I'm a conservative Christian now. Um, really what it is, is in my view, in retrospect, the radical left is a cult, it is at best cult-like. And once I left, um, my eyes were opened for the first time to outside voices and outside opinions for the first time in my life. I realized, and I'm ashamed it took me so long, how important not just voting is, but informed voting, obviously state and local elections. I think we all realized how important. It blew my mind. I was painfully aware of the fact that someone in Florida or Texas was living like a vastly different life than I was mm -hmm. through 2020, 2021, 2022, because they had a different governor, you know, and that was just a painful realization. So I wanted to be informed about politics, involved in politics for the first time in my life. And I started questioning all these things that I had assumed were true my whole life. And gradually, organically, accidentally, I realized I agree with the conservative position on most issues. Uh, to me, it is the common sense position. It's moral, it's ethical more often than not. And what I found really was that so often, uh, like we were talking about the compassionate branding, the people that the Democrats claim to want to help, they end up hurting them, the policies. You know, I, I thought they were for the underdog. I thought they were for the poor people my whole life. But then in 2020 and 2021, 2022, it was basically like, uh, screw you. If, if you're poor, if you have financial concerns, if you have mental health concerns, which is what I thought the people on the left cared about. So I'm, I'm aware of how often uh, the Democrat policies sort of screw over the very people they claim to want to help. So this is something that I, I realized over the course of about a year, a year and a half. And then I realized, well, I'm firmly entrenched on more the right now. For a long time, I was politically homeless and kind of searching. Um, I, I, I still call it the left and the right, but I really do think it's blue pill and red pill. Those who think the government is still a force of good and to be mm -hmm. trusted and those who understand it's not right. in Canada, you know, in Canada to say, you know, trust the science. And yet somehow the, the science was provincially delineated. And to say it's not politically motivated, this guy named Maxime Bernier, who is the leader of the People's Party of Canada, a small political party for which I ran in, 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 in Montreal, he was arrested and recently convicted of violating COVID protocol in Manitoba because he held an outdoor political rally at, for, at which 200 people attended. And in Ontario, th three weeks later, Justin Trudeau is attending a, a vigil for the Muslim family that was run over by this, this lunatic in a car. 5,000 people are there. One is criminalized. The other one is lionized. And then when you try to complain about the political motivation behind all of this, some idiot out there says, well, they had such things as COVID mandates. It's like, yeah, when they vary from province to province, we no longer have science. What we have is at best willy-nilly politicking and at worst exactly. deliberate weaponization of, of everything exactly. medical and political. Mm -hmm. um, when So you have the realization, and I presume at some point it's internalized and then it's no longer internalized. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, summer or spring 2021, I started uh, speaking out on YouTube and Rumble. 
And uh, I don't know, you, I, the, the, my older videos are very different than my current videos. Mm -hmm. I really was just genuinely like a very lost, uh, like lamb kind of. And I was just like, well, I, I don't know. I think I might vote for Trump. And I think maybe we should take the caution tape off of the park around me. I really was not, I wasn't a Republican, a conservative. I wasn't, I wasn't a Christian, um, which is what I am first and foremost. Now I was nothing. I was just like, I wanted to express the fact that someone might have an honest reason for disagreeing with you. Um, and uh, that didn't, I mean, I, I've been doing it for a while, but uh, have just now gained, you know, a little bit of traction because of my walk away video, which was unexpected. And I'm grateful for on, on my best days. So I've been speaking out for about two years and um, I, you know, eventually I stopped wearing masks even in the grocery store, which was, uh, which was hard in Los Angeles, got a lot of hate for that. And, and those things kind of further entrenched me in my positions of, no, I am going to speak out. I am going to speak the truth because like I said already, things just got crazier and crazier. Obviously COVID has thankfully taken a back seat, but I think it will come back again under a name other than COVID. And I want it to never, ever, ever happen again um, anywhere, but certainly not where I live. And uh, yeah, so I've, I've gotten, I guess I've gotten uh, stronger and more controversial in, in my voice online. You know what, before I'll, I'll ask this question before I forget, because I, I always go back and watch people's first videos because more <laughs> if, if everyone goes back, it's it's a fun exercise. They are typically wildly embarrassing, wildly cringe. <laughs> Yours was not because your first video on YouTube is still pretty recent. And yes. so it's not like it's not like you had posted that not knowing what you were doing or where you yeah. might be going. Uh, you have to go others. back to my acting reel for the <laughs> cringe and the <laughs> but what I what I loved in your video is you, you had what I think is everyone who is of good faith and good spirits and good intentions, original um, thought process is that you want to unify, you want to share your thoughts and you don't want to make enemies and you don't want to be hated. And it's not that you want to be liked from a juvenile superficial perspective, like, like me, like me, like me, like a pick me person. Mm -hmm. It's that you say, I want to share what I believe and I don't want to make enemies doing it. And then you quickly realize, or maybe you have or have not, and maybe I'm just projecting, you can't, there's no way of doing it. You could be the most polite person on earth and say something that someone disagrees with and you'll be a, a, a literal Nazi, even if you happen to be a little Jew boy from, from Westmouth. I mean, there's, there's no way of getting around it. And then at some point you say, okay, I'm just gonna lose my, I'm gonna lose the attempt of being polite or trying to be polite and I'll just be not edgy for the sake of edgy, just more direct, more funny and, and lose the, yes. what's holding me back. I think you've gone through that um, mm -hmm. in what I've seen. But have you been um, shocked or were you expecting it? I presume the the love and the adulation you got from your political allies 2016 to 2020 and then the shunning and not extradition, but um, excommunication that, you, that I suspect you probably got when you got vocal with what are otherwise purely reasonable, logical statements that you've been making. Yes. I like that word excommunication because it is uh, like a non-theistic church. Um, yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I, especially because of this walkaway video. Um, uh, yes, it's, it's been like 2020, uh, 2021 on steroids. It's, it's reminded me exactly why I left. It's this thing of you're racist, you're a terrible person. Um, and I wasn't quite expecting it. Um, but it is what it is. It's the same thing. Well, I could have put on a dang mask when I was walking outdoors, but it didn't seem true to me. So I'm not going to do it. And uh, I could stop the hate by getting offline. And so, sometimes I dream about that, moving to the middle of nowhere and, and not doing it. And I think that is my ultimate goal. But uh, right now, while I'm here in Los Angeles, you know, I'm not able to move for a lot of reasons. Um, I'm going to keep speaking the, the truth. And uh, the, the positive response is, is, has always outweighed uh, the negative. Even yeah, still. But, and I you know, it's important. I, it's important, but I, maybe I'm projecting again, but I think you're going to agree. You can get one negative comment in a hundred and it won't yeah. hurt you because it's true. It'll hurt you because you just wonder how stupid can people be out there? How juvenile, yeah. how, how superficial, how ignorant can someone be to actually exactly. believe this? Not because if someone calls me short, ugly, whatever, but that, that doesn't irritate me. What irritates me are people saying, um, for example, the video today that I put up, some comment says, standing outside an all girls school how creepy is that and i'm like god damn it like how stupid can someone be out there if they actually believe that's the that's the observation from this video um right okay i so, agree with you yeah <laughs> now let me let me now do i also uh, understand imagine 
that once you had the veil lifted from your eyes on one issue, you then looked at everything else um, with the same cynical stink eye and you realized that there had been multiple veils on multiple issues and now you're just peeling back the layers of this onion? Yes. Yes. And I'm sure there's still a lot of layers for me to peel back. But yeah, I was one of those people to go back to an earlier point you made about uh, black, blue pill versus red pill. I really thought the government was there to take care of me. I mean, I I really thought that there were some kind of entities, people at the top, quote unquote, looking out for me. And it, it sort of blew my mind that that wasn't the case. And if I have to guess of why more people didn't, quote unquote, wake up, I, I, I would guess it's because it's far scarier to realize okay, it's not a virus that I necessarily have to be afraid of. It's the fact that these people at the top, these global elites, they don't have my best interests at heart, you know? Um, and there are powers that be that really want to divide us and, you know, do a lot of things. So uh, yes, yeah. Um, like I said, just in, in looking at other things, you know, I was not in 2020 and for a long time before that, I was deeply, deeply um, unhappy in life. And not that being happy is necessarily the greatest aspiration, especially as a Christian now, but I had bought into the lies of my culture. And a lot of those lies are pushed by uh, progressivism. Um, you know, I had bought into the lies of feminism and, and this idea that women can do everything a man can do or, or should do everything a man wants to do or whatever it is. And um, I was deeply, deeply discontent having bought into what I was told should make me happy. And I look around and I see basically everyone in Los Angeles. I mean, so many people were unha more unhappy now than ever before, you know, and, and women have more rights now than ever before than, than our mothers or certainly our grandmothers. And I look around and I see a lot of deeply, deeply angry, unhappy people. And I think that this is all connected. And it's, it's why I speak the way that I do, because... I think there's a better way to live. Even if you don't become a conservative Christian like me, um, there is a better way to live. And we are being lied to every second of every day. And I bought into the lies for a long time. We're going we're gonna to go, I think we're going to get into subject by subject in a second. But we, I just have to come back when you said that, you know, you thought the government was there to take care of you. Yes. In Canada, the government is literally there to take care of you. But with a massive explosion of euthanasia, medical assistance and dying. Bada bing, bada boom. Um, so as you come out against COVID or as you become a vocal crit, uh, critic, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, an opponent. Critic? Oh yeah. yeah, a vocal critic. I was going to mm -hmm. say a criticizer. Uh, you become a vocal critic. A, how quickly do you lose friends? And B, did you have any issues with family for what you were saying? Um, well, I did lose, um, I was very isolated before this already. So I don't want to pretend like I lost my best friend from, you know, the womb, but, uh, I was deeply aware as I'm sure a lot of people are of, of people just suddenly not liking me. People who had, um, peripherally liked me, who were acquainted with me, who always thought I was a nice, sweet person. And then suddenly I wasn't anymore. You know, I was aware of each unfollow, which is so silly in the long, <laughs> in the grand scheme of things, but it hurts when you feel like, oh, am I doing something wrong here? Um, and I was aware of each unfriending and, and that kind of thing. And like I said, I, when I first started speaking up, I remember making these really long, very polite Facebook posts about Gina Carano's firing from Disney because mm -hmm. um, I related to her. And I didn't, I've never watched The Mandalorian. I've, I'm, she seems lovely, but I've never seen her in anything but a Daily Wire movie. But when I saw her on Ben Shapiro's Sunday special, I was like, I relate to what this woman is saying. I, I do, and I was politically homeless at the time. I do feel like it has, you know, uh, some similarities to other times in history and she barely even said anything. And I made this long Facebook post and I included the link to her on Ben Shapiro's Sunday special. And I was like reamed for that. And it was like the most polite thing in the world. And then I made another really long polite Facebook post about the dang caution tape on my park because I just really wanted to go work out. And it was like, late into 2021 at this point. And I was just like, why is there still caution tape? You know, it's the middle of a global health crisis. Maybe we should go get healthy out in the sun. And I was reamed for that too. And then I started making posts about how I support the recall of Gavin Newsom. Um, and those were very polite too. And I was reamed for that. And so you're right. It is this thing of like, I cannot, these people are, are already not going to like me. And these are people who they were old directors of mine. I mean, people who didn't know me intimately. So I guess, they were able to say, oh, well, she's always been a racist secretly, or she woke up one day and became a racist. I don't understand that thought process. And maybe it's because I had my dad, 
during the Trump years when I was really lost, but I don't understand the thought process of thinking I've known this girl at least as an acquaintance to be nice and kind and sweet. And now she's suddenly this terrible thing just overnight. Was I hiding it the whole time or did I just, it struck me one morning when I woke up, you know, that is a very strange thought process to me. And I've never felt that about anyone. I could disagree with you so much. And I still think your ideas are bad and not you yourself are bad. And I, I certainly believe there's redemption for everyone. So that, that really, really struck me of each little unfollow and each little thing. And sometimes I would get nasty messages. I still see messages on the line sometimes from anonymous accounts of we went to undergrad together and you've gone insane and it's been great (laughs) watching you go insane and it's just like first of all show your face and second of all I don't know have a conversation with me and I know that social media doesn't really beget that of let's sit down and have tea and have a nice conversation it's it's trying to own each other and have quips but I'd be happy to talk to anyone and and I didn't go crazy in in 2020 like I had a real experience. You guys care so much about lived experiences, but you don't care about mine because I'm the wrong color or whatever it is, the wrong ideology. I had a real experience in 2020 and it may have been different from someone else's, but it was authentic and we were all harmed. I mean, I, history has proven people who thought like me correct, but even if not, I mean, just listen to someone else's experiences. It blew my mind. But yes, to answer your question about my family, my immediate family, you know, we know, uh, we haven't written each other off, but it, it, it was hard. One of the hardest things I think about the response to COVID, I always want to be really careful because people say about COVID. No, it was the response to COVID. It wasn't COVID, the virus. It was the response to COVID. I think it took fractures that were already there in families, in communities and whatever. And it like highlighted them times 10. And I did experience that in my own family, you know? And so there, we were split pretty 50, 50 about, ideology and also about the shot and that has been or the the jab and that has been really hard um and i think a lot of families have experienced that and i don't know if i don't i don't even know if we realize yet you know the damage that has been done by the lies that we were fed for three years obviously we're fed lies about everything um and it's really caused a lot of rifts that i feel like didn't need to be there at all like so much of this was completely unnecessary um, so that's been a struggle, but at the end of the day, I, I love my family and I'm confident that they love me. Well, I, I say it, it has been unnecessary unless, you know, depending on your perspective for, for the yeah, government. Unless you're been, engineering it, it all. Yeah, that's right. It's been entirely necessary <laughs> and entirely productive. I, yeah. what I love is that you, you mentioned it, you know, people who knew you go back mm-hmm. and say, oh, you must've been, you must've always been this way. And it's this mm-hmm. motivated retroactive analysis where, what people liked you for beforehand, they now reinterpret in light of what they don't like you for today. Mm-hmm. Say, oh, you were always a rebel. You're just a provocateur or you're just, um, uh, what's the word when you rebel for the sake of being rebellious? You're just contrarian. Yes. Or, you, know, you used to stand up for, you know, you used to defend the little guy or the bullies. And then all of a sudden, well, oh, you're only doing it for self-interest reasons to cover up your own whatever. Exactly. It, it's atrocious. I, 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 I've not had that many friends in life, but I was definitely social and had a lot of, you know, I've, I've, a lot of people now look at me with stink eye if they still even look at me for, on a personal level. But then, you know, you, you meet a bunch, you meet a whole new world now because you're walking out of the, the matrix almost psychologically, mm-hmm. proverbially into this. And before I forget the question now, when did you go back to Christianity uh, or, or faith, I should say? Because I, I, so you said it sounds like you had a window where you didn't have it. Was the return to faith pre call it the red pill pre the revelation or post revelation? It was post revelation. I think it was something in just listening to these conservative voices, um, people like Ben Shapiro and Dennis Prager come to mind who obviously speak often, particularly Dennis Prager on, um, you know, on God. Uh, I I was called at some point to open my Bible again at home and, and I, I would have gone back to a Catholic church, but they were all shut down, <laughs> you know, and uh, the diocese, the Catholic diocese in Los Angeles was um, very much pushing the jab and pushing masks and all of this. So that was disheartening. But I just started reading um, my Bible at home. And like I said, I, I had had this deep discontent contentedness and that had been highlighted in 2020 and I was feeling uh, very lost and feeling um, very humbled over the fact that I had been proven wrong about so much and um, it was very frightening too obviously in a lot of ways to realize okay there's there's evil forces out there and people who don't have my best interests at heart and um, I've been very very wrong 
and I just opened my Bible. And uh, I'm still learning in my Christian faith. I mean, I'm reading the Bible now for the first time, because when you're a Catholic school girl, you don't like read the Bible cover to cover. So I still have a lot to learn. But as best I can tell, I think the Bible does lay out, you know, um, a better a better way to live. And I think largely we've lost that. And wherever you fall in in faith or not faith, I think there's something to be said for, you know, objective truth, which we have very much lost in this culture. And now it's your truth and my truth and however you feel. And obviously that's just chaos because then whose truth is correct? I guess the most oppressed between us is is the most has the the greatest handle on the truth, which is just uh chaotic. It's it's meaningless. And we have largely turned away from the fact that there is objective reality and some things are simply true and not true. I, I love the fact that, that I love the fact that it's Ben Shapiro and Dennis Prager who brought you back to the Bible. Those are both <laughs> very Jewish, Jewish people. Yeah. <laughs> well, I never actually knew Dennis Prager was, I'm, I'm so naive. I didn't know Dennis Prager was Jewish until re very recently when I was invited mm -hmm. to Prager U events. And then he's talking about the Bible. I was like, why is it good? And then I found out, you know, Shapiro is a little harder to, <laughs> a little more obvious. Um, yes. And I, and I love the fact that like, like I, I'm not, I, I, I maybe to a flaw, not religious in the literal sense of religion, but anybody who reads the Bible and says, I do not find moral value in the stories being told here, the Old Testament, uh, the, the, the Christian Bible, if there, you know, if there's a Christian versus Jewish one, it's a, it is a, the, the original self-help book. Some people say that as though it's an insult or undermines or demeans the Bible. I think it actually empowers the reason for which that existed and why it was so wildly popular yeah. thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 um, and now once you have the, the wool pulled back or the veil opened up on COVID, you then, I presume, see it on, we won't say LGBT rights, but rather LGBTQ2 AI plus the trans stuff, which you've been very vocal about. Mm -hmm. um, I, first of all, your delivery, when you give a video, You'll tell me how you go about preparing for it because it, it reads almost poetic, almost like a well-drafted essay, but delivered in uh, a natural, oftentimes single cut. How do you prepare for any video that you're going to do? How do you decide what video you're going to do and what research do you do to make sure that you get it right when you do it? Um, I would like to get back to making longer videos. That's how I started. And those are were very time intensive and, and research heavy. Um, and it's easy to get uh, sucked into the shorter videos. But I have lately been really enjoying, I found that you can make 90 second reels on Instagram and then Instagram will push them out to basically everyone and their mother uh, for better or worse, but you have to keep them 90 seconds. And so it's like this little challenge of um, presenting a point of view that I hold, but within 90 seconds, and uh, arguing for it, you know, in an eloquent, persuasive way. And um, I do uh, rehearse it in my head. I like write it out in my head, not on paper. And then I, <laughs> I do, I do a couple takes, you know, before I get it the way I want to get it. Um, and it, I, I enjoy doing that of like these ninety seconds because I think for better or worse, even though I, I think there's value in longer form videos, and I'd like to get back to it. You know, our attention spans are short. And uh, someone can watch 90 seconds and agree or disagree, but at least get through the 90 seconds. And so I've been enjoying doing that. Um, okay. And uh, let me see here. Do, do you know who Hotep Jesus is by any chance? I've heard him on Tim Pool, but I don't know too much about so, him. Interesting guy. I've had, he's been on my channel. I've been on his and he's an interesting mm -hmm. guy. And he, he is now, he put out a, well, you know, a challenge. It's sort of to counter the pride month of the, uh, uh, what do they call it? Good dad, July or strong dad, July. I like that. Um, it, it's interesting. And, and I'll just say this. I, I can, I think every month should be strong. Dad should be strong. Mom should be strong parents. And my only mm -hmm. reluctance behind getting behind it. This is where I sort of not don't disagree, but you know, I can understand people don't agree with me on this. I don't want to juxtapose being a good parent with pride month because I think gay men and, and lesbian women can be good parents uh, just, mm -hmm. just as well as straight men and straight parents. But, and there's no but to that actually. Once you, see the way certain things have been weaponized, politically exploited. Um, what was your realization as to how, or if, and maybe I'm just projecting all of my own psyche onto you, what has been done with the LGBTQ movement? Because I know you've put out a bunch of videos saying, you know, this trans stuff doesn't make any sense. Biologically, you have more in common with a black person than you do with a male, a black woman than you do with a male. And yet, if you do that, if you pull a Dolezal, you're going to be, you know, a blackface wearing uh, racist. Whereas if you pull a Dylan Mulvaney, you're stunning and brave to quote Tom McDonald, who I know you also love. But <laughs> yes. so, I mean, what was, 
your realization on the LGBTQ movement, uh, was it post COVID as well? Or it was post COVID. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and it's, um, it's close to my heart because, and I, I think maybe I have some controversial opinions on this. Um, but one of the first things I could vote on was not only Obama for president, but gay marriage. And I was like, there's no question in my mind, I'm going to vote for gay marriage and to see where we've, um, and I know it's a different question of, was it a slippery slope? Did it start with gay marriage? Whatever, we can maybe get into that. But to see where we've gone in just like 10 years, less than 10 years, uh, blows my mind a little bit. And and what you're talking about with that, that was one of my most popular videos talking about, you know, how I, I can't be a black person. Uh, it's it, What blows my mind is the hypocrisy, you know? Um, yes, the genetic marker for transracialism is the same as the one for transgenderism. And if we're going to take everyone's feelings and your truth as the truth, again, going back to objective truth, well, then I should be able to say that I'm black and get a tan. I mean, I should be able to, because you can't tell me what my experience is. And it obviously is, I think there's an emphasis on men, you know, identifying as women right now, but then I think that is the emphasis because women view themselves as an oppressed class. And um, it really is a, a unique situation. I personally don't think women in the West are currently oppressed, which you know, some people disagree with, but it is the only situation. And JK Rowling says this, and I disagree with her on so much, but I listened to a very interesting podcast series on her, uh, the witch trials of JK Rowling. And she, she brings up the fact, and I would disagree with her on almost everything. I think if we sat down, but she brings up the fact that men becoming women now, it is the only time in, in history really where the oppressed is being asked to welcome with open arms without question their oppressor. And I do not believe women are oppressed currently in the West and that men are the oppressors. But if you do believe that, which is what the left claims to believe, that women are still fighting for rights and we don't have equal rights, I would argue women have more rights nowadays than men do. Um, but if that's what you believe and you say that you believe that, well, then why are we being told to welcome with open arms our oppressor, as J.K. Rowling says? Oh. It, it's not coherent. Teacher, I'll, I'll answer that one because <laughs> trans men are more oppressed than biological women. <laughs> It's always this thing of who it's like with Dave Chappelle and the trans community. It's like, well, we love black men so much and we want to listen, but not if he's again, it's, it's who is the most oppressed and it's chaos. It's in every situation. It's like, who is the most oppressed? So who should we listen to? And that is not, that is not truth. And, and what has blown my mind in, in leaving the left is how little you can take one opinion on the left um, and it, <laughs> match it to another of their opinions and they don't match up. I mean, they contradict themselves almost constantly. And I guess because they think there is no truth but power. And, uh, you know, it is obviously very hard. And I think this goes beyond just women being offended by Dylan Mulvaney, obviously, who I think it's questionable whether he even really suffers from gender dysphoria, but I'm not a doctor. Um, but there are, you know, young girls thinking that they're it's really young girls who are being the most affected by this believing that they're boys and that the number across the west has exploded by like four thousand percent in a matter of years and that is clearly not gender dysphoria which yes has always existed that's what people want to remind me of that is clearly something else and i don't know if it's toxins in the environment combined with social contagion or just social social contagion but i mean the fact that you can't question it it's 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 reminiscent of COVID again and i'm sure it happened a lot before COVID, and I just didn't realize it. But the fact that you can't question it, and people's lives are being ruined, and I would venture to guess, maybe even more ruined than I felt my life was being by COVID. Because if you're talking about doing chemical and medical things to minors, and you can't question it, I mean, that's not okay with me. It, it is. Um, first of all, I was going to make a, you know, they're making the frogs gay, Alex Jones comment <laughs> because of, you know, the chemicals in the air, but w one way or the other, uh, I've I've said this for I mean I said it for a while like it's it's new to me but it's been you know people have been saying this for a while it's the most misogynistic and also anti-gay movement out there because I, I had on Chloe Cole uh, Tulip R. Ritchie and I had on uh, Joe who's who's on Twitter Unlearn sixteen she's a teacher in Canada and I think she's a genuinely uh, well-intentioned individual and some will say well the explosion is because tolerance has now become so popular that those who were living in the shadows are now coming to light. Others might look at this as a virgin suicides type you know, social contagion, which is exactly how I view it, because the explosion cannot be made sense of in any other way other than a contagion, whatever is causing that, mm -hmm. fine. Um, but that it's, it, it's an, it's an anti-gay movement and it's a misogynist movement in that it says biological women 
what was once hashtag me too, shut up and sit down and look at the male genitalia in your locker room. You now get to compete with biological males. And if you thought you were just gay, if you were a, a, a 16 year old girl who tomboyish lesbian, you might actually be a male. Let's go mess you up for the rest of your life. So that if you realize when you're 25, you were just a lesbian girl. Well, now you have all sorts of other long-term life problems and including fertility which some people might think yes. is the underlying goal to all this. As a, I can ask you this, as a woman, <laughs> Natalie, why is this not the most fundamental misogynist movement that you've ever seen? LGBTQ2IA plus has been hijacked by misogyny. Why am I right and how right am I? I, I, think, I think that is correct. And again, I, I do take the position that I, I don't think women are an oppressed class, but certainly misogyny exists. And um, it, is, it is incoherent because what, five years ago, we were told believe all women, which is also nonsense. I mean, women aren't angels. Don't, don't believe them all. That's a terrible idea. But uh, now we don't want to believe women <laughs> when they, uh, you know, have issues with this. And, um, you know, and I said it in that video when I was talking about being black is, is being a woman is obviously I know we none of us know what it is nowadays, but it's 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 more than a feeling. Obviously, it is a culmination of experiences. You know, it, it includes puberty. It includes things that happened when you were a young girl and you cannot just make up for those later, you know, and I think a male or a female, a male can know what it is like to feel like something's off as a male. But, and I'm sure that's horrible. You know, I don't, I suffered with a type of body dysphoria when I had an eating disorder because I looked in the mirror and saw something that wasn't there. I saw something much bigger than what it was. Um, and I'm not saying that's the same, but I can imagine how hard it must be to have feel gender dysphoria, but that is not feeling like a woman. That's feeling like a male feeling like something's off. And I would question that a cosmetic surgery would be the best treatment for something in your mind. And at some point adults may decide, yeah, I want to go through with this, but it was my understanding that, uh, just a few years ago, you had to go through some therapy for a couple of years and you had to live as the opposite sex without any kind of help, you know? And I, I would wonder, okay, well, why are we no longer doing that? Because we have, I mean, just in the free press recently, there was a whistleblower from, I mean, uh, a gender clinic and she's totally on the left. She's married to a trans man. I believe she's totally of this mindset and thought she was genuinely helping. And it's the same story we've heard over and over again. Um, Abigail Schreier's book, The, the Trans Craze, uh, Irreversible Damage. It's the same story over and over again about these people are not questioned. You can't question it. You go and you get a referral for a therapist. You go to one or two sessions and then you're back in for hormones. And I think that apart from the COVID jab, this is probably the biggest medical crisis of our lifetime. I think that the lawsuits will, I will see the lawsuits until the day that I die. And that brings me no joy to say of, of children coming out against their parents, against doctors. I think it'll go on forever if we don't like put a kibosh on it. And I think Finland, Sweden, and parts of I've the, the someone UK. else, yes, have recently uh, said we're not using puberty blockers, right? Except in studies. We and they Finland or is it Sweden? One of them, I think Sweden was uh, you know, has been the most progressive on all of this. And they have recently all come out and said, we're putting, you know, a little bit of a, a ceasefire here on puberty blockers, even just puberty blockers. So uh, the the U.S. and maybe Canada is j just doing its own thing. And I think we're going to pay for it down the road. Um, you know, there's, there's, it, it, well, it goes back to, I think, I don't know if it's worse with the Democrats versus the Republicans, but it, weaponizing the sense of victimhood for political profit and then abandoning abandoning them when you no longer need that and you go on to another group for political profit. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, what subject matter have you put out that's gotten you the most flack so far? Um, so you, you, talk, about... <laughs> you talk about abortion, you talk about uh, transgenderism, you talk about racial issues, uh, feminist issues. What, is, is there one that has remarkably gotten you the most pushback uh, hate online? All of the above, but uh, and I understand. I understand why it draws a special type of ire when I talk about race issues. Um, and I have made some videos about reparations because it's been in the news lately um, with California, and that that people don't like that. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll segue into it, or at least the, Gavin Newsom, I believe, is now going to shut down the idea, or has shut yeah. down the idea of actual monetary reparations. So, what have you, what have you seen in California? You've seen the same mo that you've seen with COVID, with transgenderism, uh, mm -hmm. weaponizing of victimhood, uh, weaponizing of victimhood to exploit the victimhood. Uh, 
political yeah. weaponization for political profit, divide and conquer, and yeah. then promise a bunch of things to a group for political support only at the end of the day to say, sorry, moving on. What do, do you know what the latest is right now? I think it's I think it's not controversial that Gavin Newsom has basically said we're not going to go six trillion dollars in debt to, to give reparations to force people who are the sons and daughters of immigrants who had nothing to do with um, slavery yeah. to pay yeah. those who are maybe indirectly descendants or even direct descendants, if we could say that. Uh, what, what is the latest? It's a, it's a no go as far as uh, no. He financial. said no. I think he said you can't put a, a number, which I would <laughs> ultimately agree with. I know that's an easy out, and it's a more complex conversation than that. But I think he said you can't put a number on it. And so now, what what did you say that was so outrageously offensive that it got the ire? And I'm going to ask you this: Who did it get the ire of? Because I'm suspecting if it got the ire of any group, it might be, and I might be wrong. It might be actually less. Uh, black groups and might be more white groups. And, and I'm thinking maybe it's a lot of similar people saying, how dare you? That's totally offensive. You have to shut up and pay up. <laughs> um, well, listen, you know, I'm not, I talk about a lot of issues and I'm not like in the streets uh, fighting against reparations. I just think like so many things, it is uh, like you just said, weaponization of victimhood. I think it's a way to get votes. I think uh, the black, uh, black Americans have been, uh, largely manipulated and abused by the Democrat Party. I think the Democrat Party thinks they own Black Americans, you know? So, um, and again, I would, I, I think they think that way about women too. It's it's this idea of like, I'm, I'm told every day uh, there's this meme of, you know, women voting Republican is like, they're punching, punching themselves, themselves in the face. Yeah. And it's very offensive. I don't claim to know, again, we already went through it with the trans video. I don't claim to know what it is to be a black American, but it is this idea that, uh, you know, white straight men can vote a certain way. They're just evil. But if a woman does it or a black man does it, um, they are stupid, you know, and it's what I just saw. I made a video responding to Joy Behar on The View, uh, you know, with that viral clip where she was talking about Clarence Thomas and Senator Tim Scott and how they don't really know what it's like to be black. And that's why they're Republican. And those two men in particular uh, came from nothing, especially Clarence Thomas. He grew up in the segregated South. So it is, again, it's this from the side that cares about lived experiences, but not your lived experience unless you're um, sending this message. And all, all I would say, um, I understand the argument for reparations. Uh, I take issue with the government spending really any money. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that you say it's the government's debt. Well, the government's broke unless they get money from me um, under threat of going to prison, you know, for not paying taxes. So I take issue with all of these, any government spending essentially. And I think it will do little to nothing for race relations. Um, however, uh, you know, I would just, I, I just, I, I, I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think it's going to help. And I. I think it's far more racist if we're going down that road. Um, even though everything's racist nowadays, I think it's far more racist to tell Black Americans or really any group that you cannot succeed in this country. There's nothing you can do to succeed. That the whole deck is stacked against you until basically the entire country changes. Until everyone reads, you know, how to be an anti-racist. You're just stuck between a rock and a hard place. And first of all. We've seen that's not the case, but people want to claim, well, that's just the token. That's the outlier who, you know, had to slough through everything to get where he got to. And I'm sure a lot of them did. But I know white people have had some, some have had to do that, too. So I, I personally think but people don't want to hear it because of, of my skin color. Well, you're, you're a white okay. Christian woman. How, how dare you <laughs> say I, I try to I don't pull out. I don't play that card. But. At the very least, someone can call me. I uh, say, "Well, I can I can criticize George Soros because I'm Jewish. So that, that's <laughs> that's my out." Um, no, but what's amazing is you bring it up and you talk about the the hypocrisy. And everybody says, you know, it's not hypocrisy; it's hierarchy. It's you know, it just shows you who's in in charge. You can't talk about it because you're a white Christian woman. Hotep Jesus can't talk about it because he's a race traitor. Larry Elder can't talk about it because he's the black face of white supremacy. And yet, if you dare call Ukraine or suggest that there might be Nazi infiltration in Ukraine that might be a bit of a problem. They say that can't be, Zelensky's Jewish. So on the one hand, they say, you know, the, the religion will, will protect you from all, except in the other case, if you do it and you're of the, you know, you're, you have the wrong think and you're of the wrong religion, skin color, gender, whatever, you're a race traitor. Um, yes. And well, I know you're to that end. I know you're you're making a point about the hypocrisy and how you can't speak unless you have the right point of view. But I also fundamentally do not believe that 
uh, you can't speak on abortion if you want. I don't, I don't, I don't buy this nonsense because of bl black issues, women's issues. They're all our issues. There may be Americans uh, speaking as an, you know, someone in the United States who who may be more directly impacted by certain things, and I, I understand that that maybe deserves some reverence. But there's no women's issues that men can't talk about. To act like men aren't impacted by it is is completely absurd. So everyone can speak on everything. I hope you're informed before you speak, but please speak. I don't buy this that I can't talk because I'm white. <laughs> um, now as a, and I'll say this as a white Christian woman. Uh -huh. I'm not, I, I think I perceive an, an overt attack on Christianity. I, I think we've noticed it in Canada and it's dangerous for me to say this because they say like, as a Jewish person, it, you know, it, it's almost like you can't defend who has been your historical oppressors. If we mm -hmm. want to say, well, you know, you had the Spanish inquisitions and you had the Holocaust and all this stuff. And therefore those of the certain race or religion that had been the oppressors prior, well, you can't ever defend them now. Or if you, even if you're a mark on it, you're just trying to, score points with the powers that be whatever but i've noticed it in canada i think it's 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 i've noticed it over a, a little while say a decade you can understand who can be mocked who can be ridiculed and who can't and that becomes um demonstrative of where there's a problem and where there's protections for some but not for others in canada yeah. churches were being burnt down it was 2021 some might say there's a damn good reason why, and it had to do with the demonizing of people who wanted to gather in church during COVID and the general population who's scared of COVID says, how dare these selfish religious zealots do this, burn it down. We don't know why, but there was a rash of church burnings. In the States, you know, there's a war on Christmas, there's a war on nuclear families. A am I, am I um, imagining it or do you perceive it as well? And, and, and how do you, in what ways do you perceive it? And in what ways do you think there's a way to, to push back against it? Uh, no, I would agree with you. I mean, um, I, it, it gets a little exhausting pointing out the hypocrisy of like, well, if this were a, <laughs> a, a white person saying it or were this, you know, how would we react? But even just uh, at the Dodgers Pride Night, you know, the the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, I think they call themselves. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would that happen with a, a, a group of drag performers? Um, making fun of Islam. I mean, I, I don't think that we would allow that. I don't think anyone would allow that. And uh, it is an attack on on Christianity. And I think it's because we, we view them as uh, the majority, uh, because in many ways, this is uh, a Christian nation. And, and so they're okay to attack because they have the power. And, and again, to the left, there is no truth but, but power. Um, I don't know exactly how to combat it other than um, to keep speaking the truth. Um, and I, I do take ire sometimes with the way Christians talk about things. You know, there is sort of this judgmental, I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with the judgment. I think we do it every day or we would uh, die. I think it's self-preservation, but there is a sort of a judgmentalness on the right in general, and certainly on the Christian right, that the left doesn't have, you know, uh, the left seems to hold up the sin, to elevate the sin as something to aspire to, whereas the right is very judgmental in many ways. And I can understand why people would be drawn to the left, to this idea of, well, I am a sinful person, I have done wrong things, and let me go to this place that's going to elevate me for that and praise me for the wrong that I've done. Um, so I, I take issue with it sometimes, but I think that Christians particularly, and certainly everyone needs to continue to speak the truth with grace. I think that's what Christ did. Um, you can speak the truth in a, uh, in a non-abrasive way, although sometimes I fail at that, uh, certainly because <laughs> social I've, media asks you to do it. I've, 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 I've given up. I cannot. I, I not that I'm not going to be provocative for the sake of being provocative, but I've actually think I started working my way into edgy, edgy, edgy humor. And now, Natalie, I'm not. I don't know the Bible, and I I only know you know the the, the Jack Posobiec quote tweets the Bible a lot, and some of it's very good. But I know it says, judge not, lest ye be judged, and not judge not. So it wasn't a question of not judging. It was just a question of judging others as you would have them judge you. And to the extent you judge fairly, judge away. <laughs> now, is, is that yeah. in line with biblical, biblical rule? Um, I think ultimately, you know, Christians are called to, to not judge, but I'm also not a theologian. You know, this idea of not cast, again, not casting the first stone unless you yourself have not sinned. Um, but I think also we're humans. I mean, we do judge. You judge just reflexively crossing, you know, walking by someone on the street. So I don't 
and I think Christians specifically are called to judge again the sinner, uh, the sin, not the sinner necessarily. So of course we're making judgments about there is real good and evil in this world. I think whether you're a Christian or not, again that goes back to objective truth. And can you determine that if you don't judge at all? I, I don't think so. And it's this idea. And John P Pavlovitz or whatever his name is, he comes up on my for you page all the time, and he's specifically so many people like him. It's this, you want to take Jesus and just take out the parts of him that you like and like manipulate him to be this trans, you know, gay uh, <laughs> pinnacle waving a pride flag because um, people just want to focus on the love your neighbor part. But it was, he called us to do other things. He called us to repent. He hung out with the outcasts, not to affirm them, not to affirm them in their sin, but to save them, to call them to God. So, but we just want to focus on the, oh, but he hung out with the adulterers and he hung out with the, you know, whoever else who was, uh, an outcast from society. And, you know, you're missing a huge part of the gospel, which is not for you to be affirmed in your identity and your secular identity, uh, not, certainly not to be affirmed in your sin. Jesus didn't come to affirm us, but now we're so focused on affirmation in today's world. So focused actually on affirmation that in Canada, they've passed the, uh, I forget what bill it is, but the one that now prohibits conversion therapy, which basically prohibits conversion therapy, converting, uh, you know, a trans kid to a I don't know. I think the word is cis kid, but I hate that word. And they've actually literally uh, criminalized psychologists, psychiatrists, parents from trying to talk kids out of transism, but you can certainly talk them into it. So, so the conversion exactly. has been banned one direction, one but not way. another. Mm -hmm. um, Natalie, do you have another 15 minutes if we bring it over to locals exclusively? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And now I just want to read, I'm going to bring this up here because there there's only two rumble rants, but I don't want to lose them because they're nice. One says, Kathy 1010 says, God bless America. That was from a long time ago. And Boya says, I'm in love. Uh, there was, I, I, <laughs> there was another one that said, um, it said, I, I tell, tell Natalie that we love her, but I lost that. Uh, I lost that comment. Oh. Um, I'm I'll just take your word for it. No, I think I'm in love is for you though. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know. They, um, maybe because it, it's, it's, for, it's for both of us. Um, what do you have? First of all, where can people find you? Um, I'm on, I'm on Twitter, YouTube, Rumble, and Instagram under some variation of Natalie Beisner or Natalie Jean Beisner. I didn't make it easy. I didn't think it through. Uh, <laughs> recently banned off TikTok, which I take as a badge of honor, but uh, on those four platforms, yeah. yeah. TikTok, TikTok. If we want to talk about proverbial cancers on society, TikTok is it. I know. Um, there's some questions that we have now. I think. Hold on. And is there anything that you wanted me to ask you that I have failed to ask you uh, in this in this discussion that we've had? I think we covered like everything. No, yeah, I I don't think so. I've I've enjoyed every moment of it and every. It's question. it's got like I I watch I listen to your videos. They're like wonderful essays in logic and tolerance. And you know what I love is that you're not like some basement dwelling, you know, like uh, provocative man like me. When you say it, it's so it's so um, non-objectionable in delivery in format. It's so thoughtful in delivery and format. And yet I know what people are thinking. They're looking at you like the absolute devil. How dare you say these things? You're going against the orthodoxy of the day. Um, Some people but, are definitely looking at me that way. Yeah. But still more positive than negative. And you're right. It doesn't matter how you say something. They're going to take issue with it. So. Uh, uh, for, for sure. But uh, so long as you make sense and you, and you make sense. I haven't heard you say anything that doesn't make sense, even if I disagree with it. Although I'm trying to think of anything you said, which I vehemently disagree with. And I don't think there's going to be much because I think this is common sense logic. Mm -hmm. um, all right, everybody, we're going to end this on Rumble. Go over to Locals exclusively. I'm going to share the link there, divabarnslaw.locals.com. I'm just going to go to the chat and see if there's anything coming up in the last section here, last couple of sections. Uh, oh, oh, before I forget, you've watched Dexter, right? Like Dexter, the original series? I've only seen a couple episodes. Because you remind me so much of Dexter's sister. Uh, oh, in, I know who you're talking about. And she was also in White Chicks. So she's a very, very funny actress. Um, all right. No, so, so that that was my... I've never yeah. gotten that before. I got Monica Lewinsky once, but... Well, I see that. But then you have to say like Monica Lewinsky, 1993. And then it sort of becomes like an insult, an indirect insult as to the age. No, <laughs> okay. Been. It was Light Ghosty Zero says, love you, Natalie. Uh, Vicky Lynn says, have fun on Locals. And then some other questions, some other comments, which, I, which I'm not reading just because they're inappropriate. Honor 234 says, great interview. <laughs> it's, it's not over yet. Well, let me, let me end it with this question before we go over to Locals. Or I'll ask the question, then we'll go to Locals. Mm -hmm. You are a young woman on the internet. Um, does, do, you, you, do you notice misogyny-based critique or misogyny-based commentary? Prevalent, not so prevalent, 
of the nature of the beast. How do you deal with being a young woman on the interwebs? Oh, and, and now hold on. on. That's right. <laughs> hold on. Now we're going to stop. We're going to answer that on Locals, people. If you're watching this on Rumble, move your way over to vivabarnslaw.locals.com. I'm going to end it here. Remember the question because I'm going to forget it, Natalie. Okay. And we are ending <laughs> on Rumble now. Everybody, see you soon. Peace out. And now we should be on Locals. Natalie, yeah, look. look you're a young, attractive woman on the internet. The, it's either going to be always the go-to compliments, which are irritating after a while, or the go-to insults. Is it as bad as I think? And how do you, how do you deal with that? To the extent that it clearly looks like you do read the comments on the interwebs. You don't post in ghost. How do you deal with it? Uh, I should probably post in ghost, but I want to be, I want to be interacting with people, but it's hard, you know, it's, it can get to you for sure. You have to be strong spiritually and mentally. And I've been struggling with that a little bit since the video got way more attention than I thought it was going to. Um, uh, but, you know, honestly, I can't say for sure because obviously I'm not a man, but I really don't think it's any worse for women than it is for men. I mean, people online are nasty and I don't think it really matters whether you're a man or a woman. I see I do hate the looks based comments, especially negatively, because, and I'm more aware of that now. You know, even if someone was commenting, I made the Joy Behar video and they were commenting on her looks, and it's like, and, you know, derogatorily. And it's like, I don't really want to engage in that because at the end of the day, I don't agree with her opinion. I don't care how she looks, and we could sit here and pick apart everybody, you know? Uh, so I see it towards men though, too. And I just, I, obviously it doesn't move the needle forward at all. Uh, and so in general, I'm a woman who's not going to be like, oh yeah, it's really hard as a woman. I just, I think we're so hard on men too. And we struggle with so much of the same thing. I mean, that is the, the, it's the reality that I say the negative comments I think are about the same. It's just how they materialize for women. Mm -hmm. It tends to be uh, physical based, although, but then you say that, but then, you know, they make fun of, uh, what's his face? Um, American Idol, uh, the British guy, Simon Cowell. They made fun yeah. of him for having plastic surgery, but nobody makes a big deal of it, but make fun of Madonna and it becomes gender based misogyny. Exactly. Um, and I think we're very high in tune to that. And women want to jump on that, but then they'll do it to men. And it's, it's again, it's this hypocrisy that I, I don't like. So let's just not comment on anyone's looks or I, go I, ahead I, and comment on everyone's. It's a free country. The, lo the <laughs> looks only insofar as it might be relevant to the subject of discussion where, uh, I, you know, I can't really think of any time when the looks or physical might be related to the subject, maybe in terms of health, if someone's lecturing on health and they themselves are not healthy, yeah. but we no, I just like the last few years. Oh. Um, but yeah, I know, I know that my looks do make it easy to write me off too. I think I look like I've had, uh, an easy life and I look like I've been very privileged and I, I have been in a lot of ways. I think we all are to be in America first off. Um, so I know it makes it easier to, to write me off. I do have that sense, but it is what it is. Some um, people are committed to misunderstanding you. So it's okay. Also, I'm, I'm reading some of the comments here. Now, I'm going to read some of the tips. So you have these, you got, you got YouTube super chats, rumble rants, and then on our locals community, there are tips, which are questions or comments. Okay. And one they were going to give me advice. Uh, no, no, no. These are actually, it's like okay. actual modest. <laughs> it's like, it's like a super chat. I see. Yes. Rusty okay. Gus sent a $5 tip. He says, the faith communities that engage in vitro donate the eggs. I used, I used the snowflake ministry, which then adopts them out to couples with that interest. Okay, that's it. I, I think that's about reproduction. Uh, Mr. Mike says, Viva, Danny Ans UNESG legal analysis from last night. Wow. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. I guess I'm going to just bring that up and watch it after this. Um, let's see if there's anything. Excellent interview, says Mighty Pam. Thank you, Natalie. Keep speaking out and helping to continue bring clarity, reasoning, and exposure of the issues that are causing so much divisiveness. Your voice and content are valuable. And Mighty Pear with another one says, uh, what plans does Natalie have? What future plans does Natalie have? Will she continue to make content or does she plan on a different future path for livelihood? First of all, I mean, let me ask, the, not, I don't need the numbers or crap. You, you're monetizing the content, so this is sustainable for you for the time being? No, I am, I am the world's worst grifter. <laughs> I am continually called a grifter and I, I have not, I think I've made 62 cents on my rumble. And I don't know how that to is, collect that. So I, I'm going to tell you why that's an, it's, it's, it is, it's an injustice for two reasons. First of all, you're allowed to make money off your hard work. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is if people want to see you continue to speak reason, it has to be, I mean, you don't need to get Bill Gates rich, but it has to be sustainable. Um, yes. Why have you monetized your YouTube channel or was that demonetized? Um, no, I haven't monetized anything. I, I don't think I'm big enough. Honestly, um, I, 
I say this with the understanding that I'm still a very small creator. Uh, my my Instagram and especially my Twitter exploded like overnight um, mm. with the walkaway videos. So it's been relatively new and I just, I'm still kind of learning how to do it. People tell me to make subscriptions, but it's really all I can do to make like free content. And I would want to make sure that subscriptions are worth, you know, even the couple bucks. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm hyper aware of not wanting to put people, I, if I'm going to give you paid content, I want it to be absolutely worth it. And I'm still kind of floundering on how to, how this all works, but I would love that. When we end this, I'll give you whatever tips I can offer in terms okay. of at least trying to, you know, have a alternative revenue. So what are you doing now? Are you working uh, a regular job? Yeah, I work for a family. They have three uh, biological children on the autism spectrum. So I just help them out with uh, odd tasks, driving here and there, homework. The, yeah, I've been they, doing that since I got kicked out of the restaurant industry from from COVID, from the response like, to COVID. Three of their kids are are all on the spectrum. Uh huh. That's intense. I mean, we I have yeah. uh, in, in the family we have uh, between family and friends. I, I mean, I, there we know we have two kids who are not us, but. Um, through family and through friends, it's and that's a that's a full time job for the parents. Um, mm -hmm. Three, yeah. are do they have other kids who are not on the spectrum, or, or three kids? No, three they the have spectrum? three kids total, and they're they're all on the spectrum. Yeah, that's intense. Um, and I can only I can only imagine. Yeah, but obviously it goes without saying. All the kids are are wonderful, and I'm not trained in it in any way. I probably shouldn't say this, but I've learned a lot just on the job. I just I happened to get connected to this family who wanted some help. They didn't need me to take in any experimental injections or cover up half my face, and so it just worked out, and I've been doing that, and uh, I enjoy it. Pasha Moyer, another tip here, says, I started watching late 2X and just caught up. I'm glad I caught the stream, even if both of you talk very fast. I think I talk oh, yeah. fast. So Natalie, and Mighty, <laughs> there's another guy, well, Mighty Payback in the house says, Natalie should start an above average intelligence locals winky face. We always say that on, <laughs> in, our, in our locals community, the community is above average. So you're, you're working uh, as well with three full time. This is full time day in and day out and maybe sometimes even more than full time. No, it's it's really part time. I've been kind of blessed to be able to just do it part time and still survive. But I definitely I would like to leave Los Angeles at some point. And so it's tough out there in Joe Biden's America. So I do need to do something else. <laughs> too. Okay, well, well, when we when we stop live everything, I'll, I'll give you whatever um, help I can not have insight because there, there's some tricks we learn along the way. And then we learn from others mistakes and you should learn from mine. So um, well, thank you. Let me see in locals if there's any more questions before I forget. I'm going to go to the non I'm going to go to the Overall community, um, content creating isn't easy as a full time job. It's full time. Only part time is a ridiculous time investment. It's full. Well, it's full time, and then it's also uh, spiritually consuming. Where not metrics become an important thing, but it becomes an obsession. Where if you're not creating, you don't feel like you're you're being value added or productive. And yes, but that might be I true. Anybody that too. Yeah, but, but yeah. That, that I think might be true of anybody with a sufficient, with a, you know, a, a, a satisfactory work ethic probably feels that way regardless of what they're doing. So mm -hmm. I was yeah. never one to take time off as a lawyer. Natalie, I don't think there's anything left. Locals, if you have any questions that you wanted me to get out there, um, get them in within the next few seconds. Thank you, Viva and Natalie. Have a good day, everyone. Brilliant chat, y'all. Uh, no, I think we've done good, Nat. Nat I, I wish I should have said this for everybody, but yeah, it's amazing stuff that you put out there. And every post is a thoughtful essay, um, eloquently Thank drafted. And I, and I, and I love listening to it. Plus I know that it makes people's heads explode just <laughs> common sense logic. And, and it's harder to write you off as an extremist than, you know, someone like me, but it's, it's, it's great to watch. It's, it's also great to watch the evolution that I know others have watched me go through over the last five years. So yeah. thank you very much. I'm going to post, Thank I posted you so your much. link. Everybody um, out there in locals, Enjoy the day. And everybody watching this tomorrow on YouTube, go to Rumbler Locals. Natalie, yeah. stick around. We will say our proper goodbyes. Everyone else, enjoy the day, peeps.